Hi everyone, I'm Tally, this is Farrell and we are Board of It and welcome to our review of Alice is Missing and its accompanying expansion, Silent Falls. Alice is Missing is an RPG for three to five players. It's set in the Pacific Northwest region and each player will take on the role of a high school student whose friend has mysteriously gone missing. So you need to find out what's happened to her. Yes, and this RPG is actually quite novel in the fact that it's a silent RPG. So you can say the gimmick, although it's much more than that, as we'll discuss, is that you play it over your phones uh, through a text group, although you, of course, create your characters together at the start. Now, just to note that while we bought both the base game and the expansion ourselves, the publisher did pay for shipping, although I'm not actually 100% sure if they did or not, <laughs> but just know that we probably had shipping paid for on the expansion. Alice is Missing has quite a light rule set, so there's not that much to it that you have to explain before you can get into the action. Essentially, you're going to start like the way a lot of RPGs start, by creating your characters. And here there are predefined characters uh, with, you could say, the, the skeleton, and then you flesh them out. So they might be people like uh, Dakota Travis, the best friend, or Evan Holwell, the one with a crush, or Jack Briarwood, the older brother. Uh, and you're going to kind of take these archetypes and then write down a few things to flesh them out. Very simple things. But what's also going to happen is you're going to get a card that gives you motivations and also asks you to define your relationships with other characters around the table to give them, you know, something to talk about during the chat and to kind of get group dynamics going very early on. Then you'll also pick your Alice and say a bit about her. And once the game is explained, you'll get into it proper. And the game is played over 90 minutes through your phones in a group text chat. And there's actually a soundtrack available on YouTube that is a timer as well. So it will start and then you start your game, uh, starting with whoever the GM is sending a text to the group, kind of saying, oh, hey, I'm back for winter break. Uh, I can't get hold of Alice. What's going on? And that kicks it off. And from there, in the 90 minutes, it's a very simple method of, at certain time points, you'll be given these cards, and whoever's turn is they're distributed equally, and whoever has that one at that time in front of them will flip them over. And usually they're going to say something like, oh, hey, uh, draw a suspect card, and, and this happens, or go to this location, and you find this. Uh, explain what it could have to do with the disappearance. And so you, the players are going to get these prompts and they're going to get a suspect or a location or maybe an item. And they're going to find a way to put this into the group chat. And these are what move the story along. And then eventually you'll have some cards which will narrow down the location and narrow down where Alice is and also narrow down the culprit who's behind her disappearance um, based on the ones that you've drawn throughout the game. And then at 10 minutes, someone is going to go to the location where Alice is and find out what happens to her. So for each time, there is a number of cards. So each game will be different because you're going to have different prompts and different things happening. And of course, the way you all bring it together. But there are also a number of different endings, what's happened to Alice. And then you, after that, have a debrief and talk about what happened. And that's literally it. Would like to begin by talking about how rich an experience and how unique in some ways Alice is Missing is. And that is, I think, because of the way it runs its session through text. I, it's quite novel, uh, at least among the RPGs I've played, that you're all silent. I'm a big fan of the theme. If you have played video games like Life is Strange, which the sequel has just come out, so this is quite timely. Uh, things like that. I think this theme of Northwest Pacific, uh, quaint town, teenagers, I think it's something that, you know, is in popular media and people can relate to. Uh, and I just think that 
the, the settings and the characters and the suspects the game provides, uh, it really all comes together to make what's going to be a memorable experience. Yeah, it's very thematic, for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of great points about this game which make it a really good first-time RPG. If yeah. you're maybe interested in getting into them but you're not sure where to start, I think we can probably recommend this one. For starters, there's no, well, there is a game master, but it's not in the kind of traditional sense with an RPG where yeah. that person doesn't participate in the game. Here, actually, they do completely equally yeah. participate in the game. So you don't have to have that person who's kind of out of it, yeah. which is super nice and pretty unique. The rules are really light. I mean, what are even the rules really? Just <laughs> that you can't speak. A yeah. um, couple of other little bits, but yeah, it's very light on the rules, so you can jump straight in. The game master just needs to explain them yeah. kind of once. You basically just flip over a card and it tells you what to do. And yeah, super light. Like, you come up with the rest. Barrier to entry. It's also a one shot, so you can just give it a go. It's not like you mm -hmm. have to get the same group together and have repeated yeah. plays. So yeah. that's also, again, like very low barrier to entry if you've not tried a game like this before. Um, and like touching on what you said, the fact that it's all over text, it means, you know, maybe if someone's a bit self-conscious, doesn't want to act and get into the role yeah. as themselves and talking, obviously over text, you don't need to do that. So you can just jump into your character and maybe people feel a little bit more comfortable doing it over text like this. I think this. it also gives people time to respond as well because... Yeah. You can think about what you want to say or how you want to act. Whereas if you're just doing a standard tabletop RPG, you're kind of forced on the spot, mm. right? And everyone's looking at you. Whereas here, yeah. there's a lot less pressure for everyone involved. Exactly. Yeah. And there's also a set timer. You know that it's going to end after 90 minutes. So that can also be a nice way to introduce people to RPGs as yeah. well, because you know when it's going to kind of end and there's set moments when things happen. So that again, it's less yeah. pressure to, you know, uh, make some kind of conclusion towards the end or end it yourself. Yeah. You know, there'll be that end point. So this was the first RPG that we ever played and we had a great time with it and kind of opened up the door for us to, to get more into RPGs. Yeah, exactly. I think just one thing to note off the back of that is coming back to the theme. It is something that is very dark and mm -hmm. I think different groups are going to experience it differently. Yeah. Uh, obviously, a girl goes missing and you're worried and there's a number of ways it can end. Uh, and so I think you need to be aware of that going yeah. in. And I think you can, it's going to be very group dependent as well, I think. You can get really dark with it. Or you can kind of keep it a bit, as I think we tend to do, melodramatic. Mm -hmm. I think we play more into the, the melodrama of teenagers. There's yeah. like a lot of sniping, because even though we're all worried, we have like a lot of sniping back and forth, you know, teenage rivalries coming out. Yeah. So we keep it, we manage to keep it a bit lighter, but um, it, it might not be something that's going to resonate with everyone or might get too sure. dark too quickly. The character creation part of the game, which happens during setup, is really, really fun. We really enjoy it. Almost as much fun as playing the actual game itself. It's super simple and it's really smart how you can really build your character just from kind of picking a name. They will also get a motivation, which really directs you on how they might respond to certain people in certain situations and guides you to be able to get into that character. You also assign relationships, either positive or negative, to the other, uh, other characters. So again, that helps to guide you and how to react during certain situations. And this is just super, super simple. It's not like other RPGs where you have a lot of skills and abilities that you need to think about, but it's really, really immersive. And part of the reason is because it is, again, like all over text. It's very easy to imagine your mate Martin as Evan Holwell because you're not directly looking at them. You're just looking at your screen. So that kind of part of uh, being able to dissociate is very, very easy. So this is definitely one of the most immersive RPGs that we've ever played. There's also quite a nice touch where you leave a voice note at the beginning of the game. You have a certain situation. Maybe Alice called you and asked you something and you need to leave a voicemail 
for her that you create at the beginning and then you go back and listen to it at the end of the game and then of course it could have taken on a whole new meaning depending on what happened during the story. The time, the 90 minutes, also completely flies by because it's all happening quite quickly typically because you are able to just kind of text and messages are pinging forward, moving the story forward. I was a little bit worried when we first got this game out that 90 minutes would really drag by just kind of sitting and texting, but it really flies by. It's also helped along by the cards that you flip at certain points, which will direct the story in a certain way as well. Although this is a one-shot RPG, we do think there's some solid replayability in here. You'll get different locations and different suspects game to game, and it will depend on what minute cards are in play and also ultimately what happens to Alice. And of course, the story in between is up to you. So of course, you could get some different story game to game. However, we do think it might be best to get some different groups of people to play. You could sub some people out just because the characters are a little bit limited. You know, Evan Holwell, he's always the one with the crush. He will always have the kind of same background, the same secret. So if you're just getting the same group of people, you could play the same character again. And of course, maybe it would be less variable. You could swap characters. But then if my mate Martin has already been Evan Holwell in the previous game, now I'm Evan Holwell. Maybe it just doesn't, isn't as vibrant. Of course, you can invest in the expansion, which gives you more variety in the content in terms of the characters available, so it's less limited. You get some more combinations of characters, different combinations of motives and relationships, which maybe just keeps it a little bit fresher. Just come on to the expansion, Silent Falls. This is most certainly a more stuff expansion. It's something you want to get if you want to increase the longevity of the game and the replayability. It's not something to get if you, if you want something slightly different, you want the game to shake up in some sort of way. It's literally pretty much just more cards for everything, more characters, more suspects, more locations, more of the minute cards to add that variety into the game. And for the most part, I think the additions are really great at giving the game legs. I think the, the suspects and the locations are interesting. I particularly like these um, the new minute cards because it adds a lot of variety to how your story can go. And it's also quite fun because they add new relationship cards, which then means you have kind of even more options of, of how to assign relationships to the characters during character creation. So that's who it's for, but I will say I think it does have some misses as well. Primarily the characters, which I think is actually quite disappointing because obviously that's one of the things you would hope would be strongest. And I think what our players pointed out to me is that a lot of the characters in this group are very similar in their kind of one note description. For example, one problem kind of we had is we had the crush in our in our game last game. Then we had the ex-boyfriend who's a new player in the expansion, but we also had the suspect who was another ex-boyfriend. And then it, it all kind of was a bit samey in some ways that, you know, these two guys are in love with Alice and this guy's also in love with Alice. Uh, and in a similar way, some of the changes are almost one for one. Like you had previously Jack Bryer with the older brother, and now you have the younger sibling. Or you had um, you had Charlie Barnes, and now you have Morgan Bridges, the one who moved away. And there's just not like so much, you know, narrative difference in terms of the starting point between them. And I think that's something that we struggled with a little bit. So, in short, it's just a shame that they're not more diverse and they didn't get more creative with the new characters. While so much of Alice is Missing is terrific, there are some rough edges that are probably going to rub some people up the wrong way. And in terms of the core mechanism, it can even impact your games, making them very variable. They can be excellent, rich storytelling experiences, or they can kind of go a bit zany and back and forth and narratively all over the place with not a kind of cohesive logical conclusion. 
And funnily enough, our last game had both of these things where because with the minute cards, you kind of, you know, it tells you what to do somewhat randomly where we'll say, draw a card and then this happens and tell us what happens. We had a moment in our game where we drew one card and it was basically linked this location to why Alice might be missing and a suspect. And we essentially in our narrative kind of said, oh, actually her ex-boyfriend who she's, you know, kind of talking to again, maybe thinking about getting back with, he's selling drugs at this location and it's actually a front and a lot of dangerous people hang out there. Uh, and then the next time someone drew a card as directed, that place was on fire and we actually ended up drawing, the because there's multiple cards of each location and suspect, another card matching the location we'd just been talking about. And it was very kind of fulfilling and exciting narratively because we'd just been talking about this place. Oh, now it's on fire. What can that mean? Is someone trying to cover up something? In, again, the same game, we had the opposite where we'd really created some great narratives around some of the suspects, some of them which, again, had been drawn multiple times. But what ended up happening is the culprit or, you know, the person behind the disappearance ended up being the first suspect we'd drawn right at the beginning of the game with the kind of least dramatic intention and information. And we hadn't really talked about them or given them any kind of room in our narrative experience. So then it was kind of like bending over backwards to try and fit them into the narrative to make them the culprit of the whole thing. And that was very unsatisfying, uh, considering all the work we'd done with the other suspects we'd drawn. So just something to know that it can be neutral, it can be good, it can be bad, but at least I guess it's going to be variable. Final thoughts? Alice is Missing was the first RPG we ever played, and we literally just played it again this uh, last weekend, and it's still something we very much enjoy. I think it does so much uh, so well in terms of being quite a unique experience, even within the world of tabletop RPGs. I do, however, think it has some limitations, such as what we talked about, where you know there, there's you could say a limited amount of replayability with the same group, even that maybe with the expansion, although that does definitely yeah. allow for kind of more replayability. Um, you know, the dark kind of tone of it might not be for everyone. But I think if you're looking for something incredibly immersive where it's easier than anything to get into character without putting a lot of pressure on the players or even the GM, then this is something to look at. Yeah, I think with regards to getting a different group, this is the one where you can probably most easily get a different group because of that low barrier yeah, that's to a good entry. Point. Really Whereas, good point. you know, RPGs with a lot of complexity with skills and abilities you maybe want to keep the same group mm -hmm. because exactly. it's harder to teach. Yeah. Whereas I think you could just draw pretty much anyone with this to even just give it a try one time. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. You don't need to carry on. So I think definitely give it a go. I really like that we typically tend to play it in the winter just mm -hmm. to give it a bit more atmospheric vibe, light some candles. And um, we did also play it online yeah. as well. So that's also something to consider if you want to play remotely with people. That exactly. can also be done because you don't need to be physically facing them. Yeah. So that was our review of Alice is Missing and the expansion Silent Falls. We hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, please ask us and please consider subscribing if this was helpful. We'll see you next time. Bye.